should I press got it or leave the meeting? I'm never sure. I think I'm okay. It's, it's yeah. your choice. So good morning, everybody. This is, well, good morning here in Washington State, <clears throat> Kelly T. Woods. And I am so pleased to be hosting someone who is very dear to my heart. And that is the infamous Bob Burns. And I've known Bob for uh, probably about a decade now and had the great pleasure to visit him in Scotland. He, ho he and his lovely wife Lee hosted me um, for some time at their place and he gave me the grand tour. And some of my favorite memories of my life were spending those days with, with Bob and, and Lee. But today he's agreed to join us here to talk about something very interesting, which is um, spiritual beliefs and experiences. And some of these might be regarding things that we have encountered during hypnosis um, sessions, but I have a feeling that there are going to be no limits to where Bob's going to go with this today. And, you know, Bob, when I think of you, I think of, of you as a person who is kind of otherworldly. And that was my impression the very first time that I met you, that you come from some kind of, not necessarily a different era, but some kind of different place. And that's what makes you so fascinating to be around. Every time I'm I'm near you, I learn some new perspective. And I'm really looking forward to what you're going to share with us today. So thank you very much for being here. Well, what a wonderful introduction. And the only person I would expect to be saying something like that about me would be my mother. So thank you, Kelly. Uh, there's another person in the world that loves me. It's not wonderful. <laughs> it is. Thank you for that comparison, even though I'm much younger than you. You're much younger than my mother <laughs> and me. Yeah, absolutely. So what we'll do is we, because uh, whether our friends know this or not, we spent no time on this. You just says, hey, look at the spiritual side. Nice. I'll do that. Catch you then. Catch you at six o'clock in the day. So we spoke nothing about it. I am not a complete idiot. So I've scribbled a couple of ideas that will go from there and I'll just waffle about. Is that okay? And we'll see where it takes us. And if anybody wants to interrupt at any time, you're going to write down stuff and, and, um, uh, Kelly will make a judgment when to come in and ask me. But if you feel you really need to ask, come to that point in time, I'm very, very comfortable. And I love hecklers, by the way. I'm just disappointed you can't get the chance to heckle me. I love that. Anyway, what can we do? So let's let's kick it off uh, by telling you this one that came to me about an hour ago, talking with my wife, who's spent a long, long time with me now, my English wife up in Scotland. And she understands the uh, the Doric language. That's the that's my language. That's where I come from. I come from the uh, the north of Scotland, Aberdeen, where the language is Doric. That's D O R I C. And I was we were talking about one of the first things I ever uh, that first things we ever recorded in our life that we can remember. And one of my first well one of my first memories was actually the rat's tails that used to come over the the the, the fire. And I used to giggle. I would have been under one at this time. My mother's amazed that I could remember this. So I was less than one, but I remember giggling at the rat's tails in this horrendous place that we lived in. But even before five, I remember distinctly, I was fascinated with the uh, the adults that a lot of them had the habit of saying this phrase. I realized later, it's all, all over the world. Everybody uses it. Americans, Australians, everybody uses it. But in Doric, it's fits arboid. It's about, which simply means what's it all about with a shrug. Yeah, what's it all about? So I always hear these big people, big adults going, it's about, it's about. And later, when I got older and bigger and I grew up and I became kind of like them, I realized that these people who I thought were so wise, they weren't, they were, they were, they were lost in the world. And I think that was maybe the beginnings of me beginning to even consider being therapist to work with these people who had no idea what it was all about and yet they were highly intelligent very interesting how, how, how can that happen I guess some people say it's the difference of being smart and being clever i think it's even more than that it's much even more than that but back to this whole idea with the world with the word spiritual coming into this my mother and father when i was a very small child they used to go to a place called drums lane and that was a local spiritualist church and my father would play games. He didn't believe in anything. So he told my mother to sit in the front and he would come in five minutes later and sit in the back. But the mediums would torture him by always saying, 
gentleman at the back, are you involved with this lady at the front? I told because there's a there's a light bouncing between you. We, we, I don't know what it is. And then they, a lot of them would say to my father, I'm being told by spirit, you're a very lazy man. This is Scottish spiritualism. It's very, very assertive. <laughs> yeah, it's not all about love. I mean, told you're a very, very lazy man. But what they meant was not that he was a lazy worker. He was lazy with his hands. He was a natural healer and should be getting to work. And that's not a thing he did. He wasn't a healer. But he was told that many, many times. Um, this became interesting. Uh, and over the years, my father passed away. And I remember my mother getting really involved in this other spiritualist church in Aberdeen, down in D Street. Um, for have a little 15 second segue there. It's maybe interesting for some. I met my wife in, in Stansted, the College for Psychic Research in the south of England, where I was doing a lecture at the time. And my wife was uh, was just visiting. In fact, the first, the first ever we got together was I heard uh, this sighing noise when, when she saw me. It was a kind of a... I tell everybody she fell in love with me and she tells everybody she got a psychic sign of the hell she'd be going through over the next 30, 40 years. But that's just my wife. I think it's a very rude sense of humour, but there you go. What can I do about it? Anyway, back to where I was. My mother started getting involved in this, this word spiritual, spirit, and whether we die after the grave and how we feel about ourselves. It's not about dying and surviving. It's about how we are spiritual. But the family all got a bit concerned with her. So I decided to go down to this spiritualist church in D Street and kind of sort them out to defend my mother, who's getting involved in this spookiness. Uh, the day I went in there, the medium, his name, his name was, I was in my 20s now, and the medium's name was Bob White, W-H-Y-T-E. He's a really interesting guy. And uh, when, he, when he came into the, the place, he wore a kilt to do his mediumship from the platform. And that in itself was... Uh, it was interesting because as he stood up on the platform, remember, we're all sitting there. We're all sitting in front of him. The platform is two feet high. He goes up and he did something strange like men did in that day when they pinched the knees of their trousers and lifted them before they sit down. He did it with his kilt. And I can tell you that for the 80 to 100 people there in the church, the next hour and 50 minutes was, I think, the most uncomfortable of our lives. It was just horrendous. It's Bob White, the wonderful medium, swayed back and forth, making a point here and a point there, and we watched his genitals dance that Sunday morning. It was quite <laughs> incredible. But that, that, aside, that aside, he did something, well, he did lots of things. It was well, amazing. We actually, we actually, he got us to leave, he got us to go away from there and just listen to what he was saying. He was really quite phenomenal. Until one point, he turned around to a woman sitting at the front with red hair, who later became a very good friend of mine. I'd never seen him before, obviously. And he said, I'm being asked by someone here called David, why is it every Sunday morning, early on, you go to that uh, graveyard at the bottom of the hill and you think someone shuffled me into a bog and threw me, threw me into a box? Why do you do that every week? And the woman started crying immediately. But guess what? No one got upset. Everybody knew that she was crying tears of absolute and complete joy. And I thought, I need to look at this stuff just a little bit further. We became good friends, and right enough, this had been her, her husband, who had been killed in a horrific, horrific accident, where a steamroller was involved. Hence the thoughts of being shuffled into a bag and thrown into a box. So how horrific, and yet how beautiful to be told, I'm not there. And I never was there, even while they were doing the shuffling sort of thing. And that thing part in this, uh, the, the, the talk that he gave. Uh, Bob, Fast I love forward. that. Hey, hey, Bob, we've had a request. Could you speak a little bit louder? Now, I, I hear you okay, but maybe you can just increase the tone, the, the volume a little. Thank you. Yeah. And it might be their volume, but we don't know. Thank you for that, Kelly. I'll try and do that. And everyone's got different volumes, as you know. We get this a lot. Somebody hears me, I'm too loud, and sometimes I'm not less. I'll talk a little bit louder just for that very special person. So here we go. So a few years from there, I am now an accredited healer. I went and did my training through the SNU. I read every book I could get on life after death, and I was on my way doing this, this uh, uh, kind of thing, if you like. My first case was a guy called Jim, where they sent me out to someone's house 
to do some healing. Terrifying. Really, absolutely terrifying. And when I saw the guy, he was, as we would say in these days, a cripple, yeah? He was crippled. He had the, the, the big uh, walking sticks, and he was very, very slow. I went in. I did a session with him. I was very nervous, very, very nervous. But it wasn't just nerves. Something happened where I and Jim both felt something go through us, which lots of healers will relate to. In fact, not just a little, but I'm dripping with sweat while I'm doing this healing with Jim. Came to the end of it. He still can't walk a bit. He can't move a leg. But it was an interesting occurrence. I said goodbye because I was going off in holidays for two weeks. But I would come back and see him later. When I came back, this was a world long before mobile phones. I had messages on my phone from my mother to phone immediately. And she gave me the message that she'd been down to the club that Saturday. And this guy walked up to her and asked her to dance. His name was Jim. And Jim had been in a serious accident 20 years earlier. She knew him very well. And they said he'd never walk again. And she danced with Jim. And in the dance... And in the chat, he told her this amazing story, she said, about this guy who had come round to see him, a guy called Bobby Burns. And he told her more about him. And my mother dawned on her bit by bit by bit. It's my Bobby. This is my son, Jim, that went round to see you. So she's telling me the story, but all I've got is a voice on a phone. So I jump into my car, I drive round, and I did what we do a lot in the small towns of Scotland. It's just two knocks. And you walk in. Nobody carries any guns. We're pretty safe, yeah? So we normally shout the name. I opened the door, and I was going to shout, Hi, Jim, but I realized I was in the wrong house. It was completely different. The last one was a brown wallpaper. This was blue. I said, Sorry, I'm in the wrong house. Don't worry about that. And a voice said, Is that Bobby Burns? And I said, Yeah. And Jim stepped around the corner with no crutches, walked over to me, and hugged me, and he was very emotional. I asked him about me being in the wrong house, and he said, no, I've, I've decorated since you've been gone. I've been up and down ladders. I've decorated the whole house. And I thought, you know, if there's anybody still watching this, you're going to have to excuse me here, excuse my hubris, but for a second, I thought, I'm the second coming. I'm back. <laughs> this is going to be incredible. It's me. It's me, but I'm not going to go near wood or nails this time. Shit, to hell with that. So I thought this was going to be just incredible. And of course, uh, it was wonderful. And I got to know jo uh, Jim, the family, very, very well. And uh, he was never walking normal ever again. But he walked with a slight limp, but he was fine. And I don't know really how and why that happened. Although I've got my ideas, which would take too long for right now. The second one I went to see... The same thing with the heavy sweating, but I never fixed him. And that's interesting. And that was good. I'm glad that happened early because it opened up the world for me to know, to get my ego slapped. Yeah? You're not the second coming, you idiot. Your job is not to heal them. Your job is to do the best you can. We'll decide whether they get healed or not. And then lots of things would happen in situations like that. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time for it in this session, but through my whole life since then, uh, I know it's a, it's a tenuous thing. You've got to be very careful touching it. Healers, therapists, everyone. Sometimes we'll look at a client and some, not everyone, but some therapists have the belief that they think they chose this. They chose this challenge in their life. The question now is, should I tell them that? <laughs> because some will get so angry Quite rightly so, they'll want to punch you unless you have the gift of being able to that wonderful rapport where you can discuss that. And even then, I don't tend not to go there nowadays. But some of the evidence that's come through, especially with my work in the Swan and that, Kelly, I can't deny when the part says to me, oh, no, 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 they chose that. That won't be getting better. Thanks very much. We'll make it a little bit better. But they chose this. Doesn't make sense right now. By the way, we'll get to some of that in a few minutes. On from here, Kelly. Some of the things that happened to me that have evidence that to be uh, that to be the the, the 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 situation. So I'm not a healer. I'm also the uh, at that time uh, 
the boss of a finance company in the UK. So I'm walking about town with a pinstripe suit and a polka dot tie, a silk shirt, but I'm flying all over the place doing free healings. And that went on for years. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows about this or where you come from, but in Scotland, spiritual healers never charge. So no money ever pass hands. In fact, we're not allowed under the Spiritualist National Union to accept gifts. Although that something's happened, like a parcel of fish or something like that, yeah? Or a small bottle of, uh, half bottle of whiskey, something like that, stick it in your pocket, lovely people. But we never took any money, and I did that for years. Um, and that's always been a small kind of nudge on me that causes me challenges making an income as a therapist. But we definitely haven't got time to get too far into that, and I don't think that would interest anybody anyway. But to cut a long story short, I am now really interested in this world of maybes and what's and why's. Uh, I think it would be fair, just before I move on from there, as I went on to university with that, to look up more things about this spiritual side, um, it's worth looking at some of the, the rules within this thing called, by the way, I am not selling spiritualism to anyone. Is that okay? I don't go to spiritualist churches anymore. They're great, but that's not my life. That's not what I do. But, so, but they're great. But if you look at the seven principles of that, I've got it written down here. Is that okay? I didn't want to make, make a fool of myself. They've got seven principles, and they're really great for living a life without any religion whatsoever. First, they've got the first principle is the Father of God, and that's just the Creator. That's being aware, that's being able to turn around and say, I came from somewhere. The rest is narrative. That would be another couple of us talking about that. But the Father of God is the one thing that we're run by, run by something. Second principle is the brotherhood of man, which of course includes women. That is that we're all here. A lovely, lovely line. I'm trying to think. Is it is it Das? Is that the name of the poet who says we're just walking each other back home? That's all all of us are doing. Love that. I just love that. Love that. Love that. So the brotherhood of man and woman says, guys, we're just walking each other back home. Why would you be having a war or even a crossword, you idiot? The third principle is the communion of spirits and the ministry of angels, which is interesting because I can't believe in angels personally because I don't believe in heaven, because I don't believe in the religious God. But that's just a personal thing. But I love the idea of the communion of spirits because that's been my findings over many, many years. So I can't deny that. It's, it's like denying this zero alcohol beer I've got in my hand, which is tasting lovely. So I'm very, very comfortable with the, the communion and the communication of spirits. The next one, of course, this would be spiritualism, would it? This is the continuous existence of a human soul. That's it. They believe we survive the grave, and it's really as simple as that. Uh, the... Uh, the fifth one, which is great, should be in every single uh, religion or belief or way of life. And it's simply personal responsibility. That's all it means. Personal responsibility. What can be cleaner or better than that? The sixth one, a bit wordy here, compensation and retribution hereafter for all the good and evil things done on earth. Ah, it's got to be fair. It's kind of like a karma, but a karma on the other side. You get it as soon as you go back home. You don't have to come down and live it again. So it's really a, a, a sign that's saying, here, you have to be responsible for every single thing you've done, and you'll be compensated, or there might be a retribution for that. Cuidado. In other words, be careful, because that's the way it might be. And, of course, the last principle of that is eternal progress open to every human soul. I love that. I love the idea. I mean, my favorite movie is uh, Groundhog Day. Because every time this guy, if I can just do a little swear word for a sec, sec, is that okay? Every time this guy Fs up, yeah, he wakes up in the morning, he gets a chance to do it all again. I love that movie. No matter how, you, how bad you are and you screw up, you get the chance to do it again and again and again. It's natural spiritualism. So that's why I fell into that more than just about anything. But my life, uh, I was still doing a bit of healing, but my wife changed and it took me into took me to university and my wife of course today she was a, yeah, a university lecturer in psychology I went and I studied uh, psychology philosophy and my favorite sociology and I ended up with a, a, a degree in uh, social sciences so these now I have to tell you right now psychology never made me clever 
that I know things that other people don't know. And neither did philosophy, which can do your head in, in fact, at times. Be careful of that dog. And sociology, although I love it, again, it never made me a wise man at all. But what I'm great at, Kelly, is having an argument with anybody in a pub late on a Saturday night. Yeah, I've got lots of stuff that I can argue with, which, is, again, is interesting. An example, there's no such thing as common sense. Stop saying, but it's only common sense. There is no such thing as common sense. Or everybody would have it, because it would be common, so on and so forth. But anyway, that's philosophy. Philosophy will do your head in every single time. So with all this stuff going on now, I had to think what I wanted to do with my life and although I was involved in healing, I, as you know, Kelly, I won my way in the 70s into magic, where I became a professional magician and a professional mentalist. And then I started doing hypnosis. I did hypnosis, what we call parlor hypnosis. I think it's a British word, parlor hypnosis. Come into the parlor. So it all friends when I'm having their tea on a Tuesday night at 6, 7 o'clock, and you hypnotize these people. So I did parlor music. Uh, parlor uh, hypnosis, I did uh, uh, private party hypnosis, I did street hypnosis, I did stage hypnosis, but I knew it was always going to be leading to uh, clinical hypnosis with my background and the academic stuff with me as well. It's worth pointing out at this point that I kicked off with uh, hypnoanalysis. It's not for everybody, I understand that, and that's okay. Again, so heavy. We don't have time to go into that. We're not going to turn that one over. But hypnoanalysis is fascinating, but maybe maybe too many claims are made towards it by some people who do it. Uh, another time, another day, we can get involved in that. But I trained as a hypnoanalyst with my psychological background. But then, much to my chagrin, if you like, I got annoyed that I'm, here I am knowing all this stuff with my pinstripe suit, my polka dot tie, but I know and I cannot, I cannot deny that I can get somebody up against the wall and say, look into my eyes, take a nice deep breath, sleep deeper, 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 deeper. One, two, three, open your eyes, and you're completely out of pain. How do you feel right now? And they go, I'm great, I'm feeling fantastic. And I think, why would I waste six weeks? This is taking me 15 seconds. So I had that to balance. Although I understand a lot of that time, that pain's going to be coming back because it's only that suggestion hypnosis I've used at that time. There's a big story there. And lots of people could argue with me and they'd be right to I get that. I'm not making any statements. I think what I'm saying is there's lots and lots of things to look at there. So I've got all that stuff going for me, Kelly, and everything's fine. I've opened up a clinical practice and I'm doing okay in my clinical practice. I'm getting lots of referrals because I now live in Montrose, um, population of maybe, I don't know, 16,000 east coast of Scotland. And life is just sweet. And I'm rolling on like everybody else. I'm a pure, full-time working hypnotherapist. I got involved in training, and Kelly, you'll know some of this as well. Unlike other trainers, I did not have a hypnosis academy. You had to travel to Scotland. You had to travel to Montrose. You had to come to my home where you spent time sleeping in one of my bedrooms. I'll cook for you every night. We'll have some drinks together. You come with me to my work and you sit in a corner and I don't allow you to speak. I give you a piece of paper and a pen and you watch me. And you get to see how wonderful Bob Burns is. And you also get to see how shit Bob Burns is. Because there'll be times it's not working. I got to hypnotize him. I'm not the best in the world. Uh, but you'd get to see what I did when it doesn't work. That's my favorite thing of everything. And again, Kelly, you know me fairly well. My favorite bit of everything I do is what I do when it's not working. Because when it's working, I can send my plumber to do that. You know, give him the script. He says the words, they feel better. What do you do when it doesn't work? Uh, and that's really what it's all about. If I could take, a, again, a little segue there again and give an example for people watching, that might be quite cool at this point in time. Is that okay? Yeah. So in my, so anyway, that's why I would train people in my workshops. They'd come, they'd watch me, and at night time, I'd, I'd let them speak. We'd talk about the people they've seen with me through the day. Here's a perfect example of how I do and how I work. Uh, and we'll talk about the swan in just a second. But with one particular guy, so-called Peter, I did the swan with him, and it didn't work at all, nothing. So not a problem, because we'll now do hypnosis. I did hypnosis with him, nothing. In fact, he was a bad, what we call a bad sitter. He had that invisible chewing gum, you know, that they have when they're fed up, yeah? 
<laughs> got this invisible tune going, yeah. You want me to close my eyes, I suppose, yeah. He was just bad. Man, I should have I should have thrown him out, yeah. So I said, All I need you to do is nothing. You think you can do nothing? So close your eyes, uh, because that'll help and just relax. So I then talked to his subconscious. And the deal I made was this he couldn't drive in a motorway, can't drive in a motorway. And in uh, where I live, as you know, there's only two ways into my town. That's from the north and from the south. They're both in motorways. If you don't drive, you'll have to catch the bus or the train because you don't go anywhere ever in your life. And this guy's now in his 40s. So I talked to his subconscious. I said, here's the deal. You've done this for a reason. And it wasn't even that professional, Kelly. Yeah? It was a case of, look, you've, you've done this for a reason. I'll bet it was a great reason. I'll bet it nearly just crashed the car. I don't, I don't know. He, he can't remember. But that was great. What I want to say, that was great when he was 17, because that's what, that's what he's telling me. But what I'm asking you now is, he's in his 40s. Can we do something? Can we make it better? Can you just tell him to be careful, but then put an arm around him and say, just be careful, but you'll be okay. And see what I'm saying. If you can do that, this guy will take you to, this guy will take you to Paris. He'll take you to Barcelona. You can enjoy it with him. You can have a ball. So I'm not joking, because I've nowhere else to go. One, two, wide awake. And he looked at me as if I was an idiot, as, as if to say, what do you mean, wide awake? It's not as if I've been sleeping and I'll hypnotize. We said goodbye. The next week, on the Monday at 10 o'clock, um, again, I've got somebody coming in. And I used to tell people, it's a visiting consultant. That's true. I get two for one. That's how people allowed that to happen, for me to train people while they're there and I'm earning a, a living at the same time. So the first guy that came through the door that morning, I didn't. I got it wrong. It's him, the guy that, that doesn't work. And there's this person who's now, I've got their money in my pocket. They're about to see just how shit I am because this just ain't going to work. In my mind, somewhere, I think I'm going to be running for maybe a couple of sessions and I might give them to somebody else who's better than I am at this, with this guy. And I'm very, very comfortable doing that. Anyway, I'm sitting down. I ask him how it's going and he says, the same, it's exactly the same. You mean how's it going? I said, okay. I was, what do you do over the weekend anyway? I'm, I'm talking lightly, you know. Hey, as if I'm in a pub trying to make friends with strangers. Yeah. So what did you do over the weekend? And he said, well, I went, I went to see a show in Dundee. I asked him about the show in Dundee. He tells me how wonderful it was, and I asked him how he got there, and he tells me he drove. And I asked him how he got home, and he looks at me as if I'm an idiot as he replies, I drove. I drove to Dundee, I drove home. And I says, okay, it's just that according to your notes, you can't drive in the motorway. And that's the only way there. And his answer to that was, he never answered that question. He simply said, I went to Perth on Sunday. And I said, would that be twice as far? And he said, yeah, that's, that's twice as far. And I said, do you think you're fixed? And he said, well, I, I must be. And guess what? I said I'd scribbled down that little things to the subconscious about where you could go with this guy if you wanted to. And within six months, this man has driven to Paris and he's driven to Barcelona. It's ridiculous. From a shit therapist who can't hypnotize and can't do the swan. So you get you know what I'm, what I'm getting at right here. If we've got this wonderful gift that's way, way for me, of anybody I ever work with, I want to know if they've got this thing. Because if they've got this thing, they are going to dance their whole life. It's going to be easy. And the word is rapport. Do you have rapport? Because a lot of them come into this thing, they don't have rapport. And John Chase, uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, often says, and he's quite right, he says, look, guys, I can teach you the skills, but I can't teach you the talent. You have to bring that. I think that's a truism, <laughs> absolute truism. And that talent is absolute rapport. So that's the great thing about what we do. If we can't hypnotize this particular thing, there's nothing happening, we can think, I wonder if there's anybody else behind his eyes looking at me and listening to me right now. I think I'll talk to them and see what happens for a bit of fun. So then I ask that crazy question that I ask. All I want you to do is close your eyes and do nothing. Do you think you can do nothing? Can you, can you do nothing for me? And with a little bit of smile on my face, and I nearly always get away with that, and some of the wonderful stuff happens. But right up to now, no, right now, I would suggest that I've got to a stage now where I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't need hypnosis as a hypnotherapist. Of that, I'm, uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure. 
I just do this kind of stuff that I do and things kind of uh, happen just uh, like that. It's quite, it's quite ridiculous. Yeah. I love, Bob, I love how you just throw out these things and then you just keep talking. And <laughs> there's several, <laughs> several points you've made that I'd love to, mm. to ask you more about. But what's coming to my mind listening to you, as it usually does, is belief what a what an amazing ingredient belief is no matter where it's applied whether that's in a spiritual belief or a religious belief or even belief in a cult like some of us believe that hypnosis is a cult we and we even see the gurus yep. and the, the blind followers in in our field too so when you were working with that gentleman that you just mentioned you weren't you weren't even really caring because there was some belief inside of you that <clears throat> everything was okay, whether it was working or not. How did you develop that? Well, I think it is really well, I was going to say I think that's just experience. It's not just experience. Experience is the big thing. But a couple of things come in as well. We've got this word that I hate, by the way, but I have to use it now and again, evidence-based. I only don't like the word evidence-based because evidence-based people think that everybody else, like you, Kelly T. Woods, you never went to Oxford, so you can't be evidence-based. Everything you do will be lovely, but it's just a story. That's the way we're looked upon by some of these, you know, academ academias, if you like. But once we have that, uh, that experience that something happens again and again and again, and by the way, Kelly, if it happens 100 times for you, that's nothing, because you know 100 therapists, and it's happened for them 100 times. Hey, now we've got 10,000 statements of the same thing. So this is more powerful than evidence-based. Why? Because you, Kelly T. Woods, are a working therapist. Let's be honest, a lot of the trainers out there, they're not even working therapists. So if you're working, doing this stuff all the time, and this happens, and you can't try this, and sometimes that happens, but but apart from that, while you're thinking, I could try this, and I could try that, you also know you've got another 87 things you can't try. And it's maybe, for them, it's maybe number 52. That'll be theirs. And it's annoying to say that. It's almost, it's almost I want to slap myself for saying that, saying, that can't be true, but guess what? It is true. That's that's how we that's how we find it. Although we have our favorite things that we do. For example, I get asked by students, how many inductions do I need to know? Oh, I don't know what you want me to say, but uh, they think I use on Bob Burns, I use 50 inductions. I use one induction. <laughs> yeah. And the argument with, with some of them is surely you need lots of inductions to fit the, the client. And the answer is no, 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 no. You need to get all the clients to fit your induction. So become really, really good at that induction and you'll be fine. Back again to this belief of what, how, how we know that because we do it again and again and again and again and again and we get answers because of this. We get answers because we do this again and again and again. Back to what you said about belief, Kelly. I've got a thing about belief that I'm going to have to be careful how I say this because some people won't get what I'm saying. We don't decide what to believe in life. That's my statement. That's a statement I'm making. We don't get to believe what we want in life. We either believe it or we don't, but we don't choose what we believe. It's It sounds ridiculous, but it's an absolute fact. I can prove it to you right now, Kelly. I'd like you for $20 million to believe that my name is Brenda and I'm your sister. It's not going to happen, is it? It's just not going to happen. So we fall into, well, I'd like to believe this. The lovely saying is, I'd like to believe it, but I can't. I really like this person. I'd love to believe this, but I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't for whatever reason. So if I can't choose what I believe, I do have something that I do have a power with. And it, and maybe it's not going to be belief. Maybe it will be. But there's something I definitely can't choose, and that's my intention. I am powerful with intention. With intention, I can move mountains. I can create stuff that's just ridiculous. And I've got a little part of me, and this is... I, I, People are going to knock me for this, quite right, quite rightly so. A couple of decades ago, I would have knocked anybody for saying what I'm about to say, but I've got this ridiculous belief inside me that we're all like gods in the making. Do you know that? And if I believe I can do this by doing that, chance that this is going to work. And that is ridiculous. I'm saying it, and it's ridiculous. But these have been some of my findings. Some of my findings will be that if I can get the person to play a game with me 
some miracle can happen. A perfect example would be in the placebos, yeah? I don't have the details in front of me. I can get, get them to anybody that wants to ask me or send them to them personally. Uh, but they'll probably already have heard the story of, in fact, I've, I've written it up in, uh, in one of my books. Yeah, It's about the guy who comes along in a wheelchair. He's got all kinds of pains. And, and they say to him, he's arrived in the hospital and they say, we want to give you a, a couple of placebos, then we want to try something. And he looks at him and goes, jeez, is that, is that where I am? We want to give you a couple. Of, and they even tell him there's going to be placebos. And he says, can I just go to the toilet first? And they ignore what he's saying. They say, no, just swallow these placebos first. And that's where you can get to the toilet. We'll get you there in two minutes. Horrendously bad manners. He shakes his head slowly. He's been used to be being treated like this so badly. He allows it to put the electrocephalograph onto his head and what have you. He takes his two little placebos, he swallows them down, they look at the screen and they say, okay, we're we are, we are done here. He strides, he doesn't need the wheelchair, he stands up and marches to the toilet 50 metres away, he comes back again, and they show him the findings. Something happened when he took the placebos. Now remember, they told him it was a placebo, he knows it's a placebo, he took the placebo, no games are being played, and yet something inside him said, <laughs> should we play because what they saw was his brain making dopamine and that dopamine going down his spine to areas of his body where suddenly he can move and he can march now that is ridiculous and Kelly as you know I'm famous for handing out placebos I've been doing that for 20-30 years and I believe in the power of the placebos I hand out I never lie I always tell you what can we take a couple of placebos and try this and see, see how we get on I even know things about placebos. I know that if it's bullet-shaped instead of round, three times a better chance it'll work. I know it's red instead of blue, far better chance of working. Unless you're Italian, it'll work if it's blue. It won't work if it's red. And so on and so forth. It's a really interesting one. By the way, I've got Italian friends. If I ask them what kind of placebo, what color placebo would you like? Blah, they want a blue placebo. I don't know what that's about. And wow. so on and so forth. It's azure. Azure is the color of the national soccer team. Of course, yes. That's absolutely right. And I think in Spanish it's a few less, isn't it? But what the hell? <laughs> in other words, Perry, in, in, in other words, if we Kelly, if we pretend to do things as an, as a child, it's probably not going to work because we're just playing a game. But if we can do this with experience as well, it's interesting how we sometimes get to change the game. We we'll get to do something with it. But again, my favorite word there, belief is really, really strong. But I know that belief many, many times doesn't we know it doesn't work. It's 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 it would be great if it did. But it will help for sure. It'll definitely help will create miracles. But my God, intention is just incredible. Very, very powerful. I love where you're going with this. And you know, so many times, you know, I work with people as you do who have chronic issues and and especially things that they've been dealing with for years, whether it's a physical thing or a mental thing. And what happens is that they often arrive in our care feeling pretty hopeless. And one of the things that I that I like to promote is hope. And that doesn't resonate with them. They're like, uh, I've hoped before and I've been disappointed. But what people don't realize is that, you know, hope isn't an emotion, it's an essence. And how do we get hope mo um, going and, and compounded? It's through intention. So having wishes, having dreams, those are forms of intention, aren't they? And that promotes the hope and it keeps it alive. It, it never truly dies in a person, I believe. I, I believe it's always there even if it's overshadowed by their, you know, experiences or even their own beliefs. And when we can get them to formulate some of those intentions, even if it's just to have a pain-free hour or to see their grandson's birthday, then that hope is sparked and it can grow in them. So I think that distinction between intentions and belief and hope is really important for us to know because I know there's a lot of hypnotists that get discouraged that if they have some of those perceived fails, that that knocks their confidence down and their belief, even in hypnosis um, being a viable mo modality. So thank you for, 
for sharing your your beliefs about that. And I think it's really profound. And what I love, one of the things I love most about you is your flexibility. And you're constantly censoring yourself. And and that is, you know, part of you of your <laughs> humility, which is is um a great juxtaposition to your wonderful ego. I love it. <laughs> and I think it's part of your, to be. Your, you we have to, we have to have that balance, right? Um yeah. so it, this is great. I'm getting so much. One other thing I wanted to ask you about, you had just made a brief reference to a little inner conflict you have about um spiritual healing, not charging a fee and then having to move into therapy and charging a fee. We just yesterday had a, a thread in my hypnotic women group about that, about this was specifically, do you charge friends and family for your services? And so there were a wide spectrum of answers for that. And this, one of the um, typical answers is that if a person doesn't pay, they're not going to find results. What do you think about that? Well, we can say a lot of time, first of all, by saying it's not true. Uh, and that's that one done. The next question is, should we talk more about it? The answer is yes, absolutely. Because the person that's saying that, they're not a monster. And I understand why they're saying that. It's absolutely true. Because you've now done something for me that's absolutely cheap. You said, well, how do I go at this? I don't want any money. So you haven't put any importance on it. Uh, the best way I could I'll give a perfect example on it, if I can, Kelly. I used to charge 50 pounds to stop smoking. I thought I was good. I can tell you no, I had a 60% success record. And I thought that was great. 50 pounds, 60%. I keep all my files. Six, six out of 10 people, three or five people, 50 quid, they'll never smoke again. And I and I went online and I bragged to the Facebook nation of the hypnotherapist about how good Bob Bonds was. Guess what? Everybody told me I was shit. Everybody was better than me. The average person, I'm told by reading it, 90%. Nine out of ten people, they fix. And I thought, I'm shit by me. I'm shit. Everyone's better than me. What am I doing wrong? Then, Kelly, it's a dreadful thing, but I stopped and I asked myself a question. A wonderful, beautiful, obtrusive question. It came out and, and it went, what if they're lying? <laughs> Sorry? What if they're lying? What if somebody's been lying to you? What if it's not 90%? So I had that thought. And the second thought I had was, I don't know if they're lying or if they're telling the truth. But what I need to do is one of two things. Give all my people to them who are so successful or become better and find out how I can become better. And I promise you, I am answering your question, your direct question by the answer to this. I said I need to do something better. First thing was I spoke to my friends about the 50 pounds to stop smoking. I'm a former smoker. If you told me you could fix me from smoking for 50 quid, Kelly, I'd give you the 50 pounds. I don't think I'm going to stop. 50 pounds. I'm, I'm spending 5,000 pounds a year, 100 pounds a week. You're going to fix me for 50 pounds? Again, we've cheapened it. Yeah. So that was number one. Number two was what happens when you fail in the first week? In other words, well, if it didn't work on in, in Monday, how will it work on Tuesday? I love that question. It torments me. I'm not happy with it. I'm uncomfortable. I love being made uncomfortable. I think it's a fair question. So I needed to be able to answer that one. So I got an answer for that one. And number three, the good your work. Will you guarantee it? That's scary as hell. That terrified me. So I decided I'll guarantee my work. I'll do something on the second one that will scare the hell out of them and make them stop. And I'm not charging 50 pounds anymore. I'll charge them 500 pounds. And this was about eight to 10 years ago. I put my fees up from 50 to 500 pounds. Kelly, they came from everywhere. I charge is 500 pounds. It's got to be decent. And of course, my I'm a salesman. Here we go, Kelly. You ready? I worked out what, what you tell me you, you spend on cigarettes. It's 4,000 pounds a year. So what I'd like to do, Kelly, is the first year, I'd like to save your life on 3,500 pounds. And every year after that, 4,000 pounds a year. Does that sound okay? And I can do all of that by simply charging you 500 pounds instead of the 4,000 pounds that you've paid. I was telling this to a couple yesterday, and I didn't do it too well, Kelly. The guy kept arguing with me. I let it go. I just let it go because he wanted to win the argument. But here, here's what I said to him that he wasn't listening. I have never lost a client by telling them my price at 500 pounds to start smoking. And I swear that I've never lost a client. He asked me how my success rate he asked me what my success rate was, and I said, 
I failed twice, and I've handed the money back. Yeah. yeah. And the guarantee well, I give them is not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee they'll stop. It's a one-year guarantee. I'll be with you for a year, buddy. Whatever happens. So that's what I do there. Okay, I love that. And what would your answer be when it's a cancer care client who wants some relief from pain from the treatment they're going through? Hardly ever will I charge for that. I don't advertise this, by the way, but hardly ever will I, will I you know, you know my missus very well. Yeah. Feel free to have a chat to her anytime. She'll tell you she's angry. I've got droves of people who are on free money. I charge £120, which isn't cheap. But it's not expensive because I've got a worldly clientele. It's too expensive in certain areas. But I'm sneaky. I'm sneaky, Kelly. I'm very, very sneaky. If somebody comes to me like that, they've got cancer, they're in pain or whatever, the chances of me charging them is very, very small. And I'll do it. And, I'll, and, I'm, and I'm so sneaky, I won't tell them I'm doing it to you for free. That's not what they want. They've got a lot of pride. The deal they're going to find is, guess what? This week is cancer free week. Woohoo! They look at me as if I'm a raving idiot. Yeah. So I will lie to them. I will lie all the time to get them whatever I can. Single parents is one of my favorites. And it's very hard to take a fee from a single parent. And I make enough over here so I can do that over there. Yeah. Many of my my uh, my good friends who are therapists, uh, I see I've, I've got a good clientele. They're seeing two people a week and they're charging 40 pounds, maybe. 40, 50 pounds. I can tell you now, they're as good as me. They just haven't had the breaks that I've had. They've been doing it for 20 years or so. And this is enough for them. So I get all of that. So what I'm not interested in is, you need to charge at least 500 pounds or 150. Or none of it, none of it is true. Even what I say, none of it is true. So you make your mind up and you go with that. The back of that one, that question you said, if you don't charge them, you can't fix them. It's not true. We get great results with people for free. They're so, they're so grateful in other ways. I mean, I've had, I've had my room painted with somebody whose back pain I took away. I should have charged him the money, Kelly. I ripped him off for seven times as much. He wouldn't take any money for painting my house and so on and so forth. On it goes. Right. Uh, you know, I have similar experiences. And once again, we're in, in Zapatico. That's, that's fantastic. Another area that I'm really fascinated, and I know that you have delved into, is the dream world. You're a bit of an expert in lucid dreaming, aren't you? How does that play into um, clients' belief systems? And, and how do you parlay that or even help guide them so that they can tap into that realm? Well, I'm a, I, I wouldn't say ex I'm a lucid dreamer. I'm a natural lucid dreamer. I lucid dream most nights. Uh, but it's the quality of the lucid dream that counts. But in the week, I'll get a couple crackers. I mean, absolute crackers. And, and I'll be there. And there's a Chinaman giving me tea and a saucer, sitting cross-legged in a mountain somewhere in the Far East. And I'm looking at him and I'm smiling. And suddenly I put my hand down to my side and I go, ooh, what's that? Well, it's the side of my bed. <laughs> yeah? And I put my other hand down. Ooh, that's, that's my wife's left knee. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, I'm lucid dreaming. So that's how powerful it can be for me. Uh, and I've got friends who are far more powerful than me. I mean, I love them. They're just great. They're at a level that I am not at. They can. So we're all at different levels. <clears throat> so I do lucid dreaming. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting on that for anyone who's listening. I did a free lucid dreaming class about bear with me four or five months ago. Uh, and I did it over four weeks. And it was free. And I wanted to test some things to see how it would go. For me now, it becomes interesting. For me, it was it was a it was a kind of a failure. It wasn't what I wanted out of it at all. Two people had a lucid dream of the whole batch that I got. They, unless they're lying, and they might be, they might just be lovely people, they told me they thought it was fantastic. But they got things that I wasn't looking for. For, for, for example, a lot of them now are dreaming and they don't dream before. They never dreamt before. So they started dreaming. My problem is I just got the goals wrong. I wanted it to be absolute lucid or total failure. Yeah. So cool. I need to, I every now and again I need somebody. I need I'll tell you what I need, kill. I need a monster. I need somebody to be the monster that I need to slap me about. An idiot. Yeah. So they, they really enjoyed this. But the lucid dream that I do, I'll sit with somebody and I'll show them the things to go through how they can lucid dream. I'm not selling anything here. I don't have anything to sell, but soon I'm going to be working with Hayden Ebert, who is my stepson. He's a brilliant lucid dreamer. We're going to put something together 
and we're going to see if we can write a programme for some people who might be interested. I've got nothing now. I've got no start date, but we'll think of doing it then. But enough. Suffice to say that right now, yeah, lucid dreaming. If you can just do some simple stuff on it, uh, you can. things can happen. And of course, I use my swan. I show people the swan. So my group will be doing swan lucid dreaming. And I think you'll get better results doing that. It's really great. If you've got a part sitting next to you saying, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, we'll do it tonight. Let's go to bed. That's quite cool, yeah? So that's what we're going to be doing there. But I love lucid dreaming. I mean, imagine, Kelly, we, we sleep for a third of our life. Let's say we live for 90 years and we're asleep for 30 years. Who? Why? Why would you want to do something without 30 years? I lucid dream truly most nights. And I just absolutely love it. For me, it's absolutely as real as here. Can can you give um, attendees some tips on how to how to elicit lucid dreams? Yes, very quickly. Okay, so bear with me, but very quickly. Uh, let's say I was talking with you right now, Kelly. I said, okay, that's what I want you to do tonight. See, the problem, before I start, this is going to be really annoying. I know it is, but my apologies. But most people, it's like, you know what it's like, Kelly? It's like when I was in Melbourne, like 12 years ago, doing a workshop. And this guy at the back put his hand up. He says, just want to say it's really great that you're here. You're doing this for us. Your only charge is something like, um, whatever it was, $800. But I'll tell you what, Bob, after this, we'll know everything that you know. We'll be your competition. Why are you doing this, mate? Why did you come halfway across the world to give us all your secrets? Well, how are you doing that? And I said, well, it's very easy. By the way, I didn't have a clue how to answer them. And I'm thinking while I'm speaking. As you know, Kelly, I've got a habit of doing that. You will never use it. And there was silence for about as long as now, and the whole place collapsed with laughter. But guess what, Kelly? That's the truth of it. They leave my workshops, and they go home, they get the notes, they put them in there in the bottom drawer, and they're going to read it again on Saturday. Soon Saturday becomes September. They look at the notes, they can't remember what this was about. And I think it's the same with lucid dream. It's the same with most things. People go, that's great. I'm going to get sucked into that. I'll do that tonight. I won't do it tonight, but tomorrow they'll mean to do it on Friday, and Friday they'll have a night out. A week has passed now to 10 days. The initial enthusiasm is gone. Initial enthusiasm is so powerful because after the initial enthusiasm, Kelly, they're stuck with just enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is great, but it's not nearly as powerful as, as initial enthusiasm. I'm a mon I am one of the monsters. I go to, to Italian cooking and I take the meal home that night for me and my wife, and tomorrow night I'm making it again. I do that for six months. I go to Chinese cooking every Monday. We eat that meal when I come home. Tuesday, we're having that again. That's me. As you know, I'm scripted with most things I do. I need to, I need to get it because I know my initial enthusiasm is going to be gone soon. So I'll do it now. But here we go to answer your question now. So here we go. What I want you to do tonight is this. And by the way, some people don't want to pay the price. There's a lovely saying for everything, there's a price. All you've got to do is two things. Number one, find out what the price is. Number two, pay the price. And as I say to my clients, can you do that? And they go, oh, they look terrified. <laughs> let's find out what the price is and let's find out whether you want to pay it. Will you pay the price? Here it comes. Everybody I, I do this with, they go, yeah. So they lie to me. <laughs> so I won't do it. <laughs> That's okay. So here's the price, Kelly. I'm going to give it to you right now. Tonight, I want you to write down a piece of paper. Uh, tonight, I'm going to dream. And in that dream, when I wake up, I will remember that dream. That's it. You read it three times, you go to sleep. But, Kelly, but, 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 but. It's got to be a lot harder than that, yeah? Now, it depends. On every, so we might have to change it for someone's days, for the kind of day that they're having tomorrow. But most of the time, I'll be saying to, I'll be saying this to the person. I now need you to set your alarm for 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. I need a pad and a pen at the side of your bed. And when that alarm goes off at 2 o'clock, you, <sighs> you turn and you start writing immediately because you are now in alpha. Alpha happens just before we go to sleep. Remember that wonderful dream where you think, to, oh, I'm going to remember this because I'm going to... And you're gone. You've lost it. Or you wake up in the morning, you go, oh my God, that was fantastic. And somebody says, what? And you go, oh my God, it's, it's gone. It's gone. Because it only lasts seconds. So two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, alarm clock goes off, boom. We start writing. We just start writing, 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 writing. And I am telling you now, two, three days, I've got somebody who remembers 
all their dreams all of the time. That's what we've done in 72 hours. Now we're into something else. Tonight I'll dream. And in that dream, I will become lucid. And I will know that I am lucid. Now we see what happens. Now it becomes really interesting. Now we're taking another step into this mayor. Now we're working. No more of this shit. Yeah, well, th I think it'd be, yes, I'd like to hope for this and I'd, I'd like to believe this and I'd like, no, we're working. We've got shuffles, we've got picks, we're really working on it. On Kelly, we're paying a price. I've got the pod, I've got the pen. I'm going to spend time buying the pod. I've got pods, but I'm not going to get a special pod. I'm going to go and get a special. By the way, don't do that. That's what a lot of people do. They make it too special and then they don't do it. It's the doing of it, not the stuff you've got, yeah? So a pod inside the bed, pen, and two, four, six, you can change it. You can change it to one, three, four. That's the questions I get. Yeah, change it if you want, but try and get yourself in a way where that happens. Remember, there'll be a fourth wake up as well after that. Two, four, six, mm -hmm. and there'll be your fourth normal wake up, which might be eight or nine. And then again, you've got that. You've got stuff now. You have got stuff. You read it and you go, Shh, I can't even remember writing that stuff. And as you're reading it, you'll think, wait a minute, I do remember writing this stuff. And then suddenly, something's activated and you're not remembering it. Okay, so this is okay for remembering dreams. The next batch is really interesting, is it? The next batch is where we become active. And I know, shit, I am lucid. I'm like, just, like the, uh, just like the waking up, I can hold it. I can hold, wouldn't it be great if I could hold it just like that? If I could hold that area and I can look at that face and I don't fall off to sleep and I don't wake up. And wouldn't it be great if sometime, at some point, I could ask a question that's important to me. I have a problem with my left knee. Is there anything you can do to help me? Because it's really severe. I have a problem with heart arrhythmia. Is there anything you can do to help me with that arrhythmia? I have a problem with, with anger issues. And I, I don't know, even know why I'm I'm not even angry. Yeah, I act as if I'm like, can you do that? Is there a reason why? And then wait and see if the person opens their mouth and speaks. I remember many, many years ago. I feel an idiot to tell you this, Kelly. I'm, 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 only, I'm almost upset that other people I don't even know are listening to me now. But, but somebody told me to do this, and I did it. And it just worked great. His name was Jack Black, not the actor. No, Jack Black. And I said, I get this guy. And he's like, it's like he looks a bit like Jesus. He's throwing this net into the sea. He gets up, and he's got a long, white flowing robe. And I wave at him, and he waves back. And he comes off the board. I've had several dreams like this. And he walks up to me and he stops. And I become lucid within it. And I, and, I, and, I, and I ask him a question. And he never answers. And this guy, this friend of mine, Jack, said, Have you tried tickling him? Yeah. I said, say that again. He said, tickle him. It will evoke something. If you tickle me, I'd say, hey, man, what are you doing? Something like that. I'd, I'd say something. And just as it happened that night, I saw the guy with the net. He came, he walked up to me, and I knew I was lucid. And I remember Jock, and I actually reached for him, I tick -tick 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 -tick. <laughs> and he laughed, and then we had a great conversation. How ridiculous is that? Okay, so I'm not saying that's a real man in a boat with a net. I'm quite happy to accept that hey, maybe that was my imagination that, that made this up. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it either. Remember, the name of the, that book I put out there is Real or Imagined. So I never make statements that are factual, ever. I try, I try and keep away from that so that we can always say, hmm, maybe, like that Chinese farmer, maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll just let's see, see what happens here. But that's some, some uh, tips for anybody listening how to start off. And by the way, can I tell you something now, Kelly? I can guide somebody to a £2,000 course to learn lucid dreaming. And what I've just told you now, and I'm going to get hell for this from some people for sure, it, that's all you need. It doesn't get much better than that to get your two grand's worth. If you can do that, if you can activate that, something is happening. Because a lot of these things, when you go in these courses, you know, oh, it's been eight hours now and you really haven't picked up that much. Well, again, tomorrow you won't be lucid dreaming tonight. You'll be sleeping. You'll be dead. You'll be knackered from this long day you've had. So anything that's got movement behind it so you're doing something is wonderful. The great thing about the alarm thing is you don't get to sleep in my course. You have to wake up three times in the middle of the night. Do some people drop it and not do it? They lie to me, I think. They, do, they, they tell me yes. Other people are even more honest and say, I woke up, I was so sad, I just went back to sleep again. And I smile. I do this, I do this, kid. I go, that's okay, don't worry about that. When I really want to say, why am I here? 
why are you talking to me? Why did you come all this way and ask me? And I've said, yes, if I go to somebody to, to ask for something, they tell me, I'm in there. I'm, 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 I'm buying it. I'm, I'm, I'm right in it. Because lucid dreaming will blow people away if they can get there. And so on and so forth. And all of this, of course, is linked to the spiritual. It's what we talked of right now. I'm not religious, Kelly, but I pray, I've prayed every night of my life, but not to God. I talked to the guys in the big room where I came from. I have a word with them. Oh, what's happened? Look at this stuff. It's happened today. I know you can't fix it. I know you'd like to, but you're not allowed to because I came here for this. And I know I've got these aches and pains, but I came here for this. And compared to infinity, I'll be back real soon. But any chance to just give me a little help with this bit over here? And every now and again, I get the miracles of this little bit over here, Kimmy, getting a little bit of help. Yeah. Never asked her too much. And something like that happens. It's just there. Uh, it's wonderful. And of course, Kelly, in all fairness, I'm into it. I'm, I've never taken drugs, but I'm a great believer in ayahuasca. Wonderful dreamer in DMT. Take it regularly. And I love mushrooms. I'm Scottish. So more than anything else, we're into magic mushrooms. Five grams. Kelly, don't take two, two and a half. Don't shoot me. Five grams. Don't put on any nice music. Get it off. Don't go outside and look at flowers. Dark room. Close the door. So dark room. Music off. Five guns. Wait. And you'll have the time of your life. That's how it works. <laughs> I'll, I'll meet you on that mushroom tour sometime, I'm sure. You Can know, I say yeah. something? Sure. Right. So actually, you know, because I just spent uh, almost three weeks in, in the Amazon with Achuar people. And they are known as the dream people of the Amazon. So, you know, we, we did this every, you know, we did this, they do it every day. They wake up at 4 a.m. and they talk about their dreams and their whole life decisions that they make, uh, what they're going to do that day, you know, or that, that week is based on their dreams. Um, so, you know, it was, it was really interesting because, you know, before every night I would put an intention to dream and remember, and I naturally was waking up every couple of hours with my notebook and just writing it down. And, you know, I just, you know, I, I just love this. So I want to dig more into this, the dream work, because it really is quite incredible. Not to mention ayahuasca and, you know, and all that stuff, but, you know. Well, of course, the, the ayahuasca is taken, but the DMT is what's in ayahuasca. It's easily made. I mean, me and my friends, we, we make DMT now. It's a class A drug, but it all comes from the bark of a couple of trees around the world. And it's the difference with DMT is you take you take a puff. Um, I've done this to friends of mine. And you take a puff. And I say, okay, take another. And they go, oh, I yeah, uh, I don't think I really need another. They're already there. Yeah. Watch out! You might, you're you're going to start getting the placebo effect, Bob. So. <laughs> yeah. <it's true. laughs> right. Whether you know whether you're making the intention of having that lucid dream or using those mind-altering substances, um, that intention is there. How There's another intention. And I remember you and I having a, a wonderful conversation where I told you a story about my son and you put it in, in your book, Hypnotic Stories too. Thank you. Yes, and, absolutely. And um, he described the way that he, that he live, lives as living cinematically, like he's in a movie. And he's just amazed at all the, the things, the other players that are coming into it. And, and he's paying attention in such a way, I called it living hypnotically. And being able to develop your attention in that way, it changes everything. For me, it is, it is um, a, a spiritual <laughs> experience because I'm, I'm noticing and seeing things in everyday life that are often... Um, below people's awareness. They're distracted by their own thoughts or immediate concerns. And how can we, how can we help clients develop that ability? Because it makes such a more rich existence on, on many levels. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, it's a lovely song, isn't it? Called uh, the, the Games People Play. It's just a beautiful, beautiful song. Uh, and I myself play games. Um, so I'll ask certain clients in certain situations to go out and do certain things. We'll have 
will have tasks for them to do. Uh, make someone happy a task. Go out, and the first thing you do every day, the first thing you do every day is you go and you please somebody, you do something for someone. One of my habits I really love is going into small cafeterias, seeing the old couple in the corner, sitting next to them, smiling, chatting, nodding the head, and then before I leave, I pick up the tab for their coffee and cake. It's a small thing, but they get a lot out of it, and I get a fantastic amount out of it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, can I can I tell you something that happened to me uh, last year? I wrote about it for a special group of mine. I don't think I've put it anywhere else. I was in the centre of Montrose, and I just done that. I, I just pick up the, the the thing for somebody, and I nipped next door, and I went into the post office, and I was feeling good about it. And by the way, uh, Kelly, you will have noticed it. I've developed a habit. It started off as an act. I'm telling you that now. It started off as an act. I'll smile. I'll say, hello. I'll nod my head. I'll make an open-handed gesture. I'll say, how are you? Wow, love that dress. I love that tattoo or what have you. Started off as an act years ago. Now I've become that guy. I can't even get rid of him. It embarrasses my children and my English wife. But I'd say, I, you cannot be a bus stop and not talk to me if I walk next to you. I will find out all about your hobbies sometime within the next three minutes and so on and so forth. But this day, uh, just last year, I came out uh, of the post office and a woman across the road uh, I swear to you, this is exactly what happened. She went to me like that, and it was, she seemed a bit fuddy duddy. I don't know if that's a thing you understand over there. It's a British thing. Fuddy duddy, kind of daft, daft, dafty wafty. Just, uh, she gave me a silly smile, and, and I looked and I looked around, and it was definitely me. So I smiled and waved back to her, and, I, and a bus came along, and the bus left, and she was gone. So she must have got on the bus. Now, I went home, and the next day, I took five grams of mushrooms, Liberty Cup mushrooms. I sat in the room, and I thought, nothing much working here, until someone says, hi, Bob, how are you? And I look, and there's a guy standing in the corner of my room. And I smiled, because I thought, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm supposed to get bright lights, and so on and so forth. And, but no, there's a guy just standing there. And he started talking to me openly. And he says, let me tell you about who you are and where you came from. And he went like that. And it was like the movie The Matrix. You know, ah, I know Kung Fu. It was kind of like I knew lots of stuff. And it, it, the funny thing is my reaction was, and Lee could hear me, but she never came into the room. I started sobbing a lot and crying. But I can tell you it was pure joy. I knew that I've been around for a couple of thousand years. And I knew why I'm here. Well, by the way, Kelly, you ready for this? I, 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 I know, I know everything. I mean, I know everything. But here's the bad news: I can't tell you, Kelly, because the guy says to me, "When we leave here, Bob, you know we're going to have to take this back. We'll leave you with the memories that you know everything, but none of the memories will stay." And I started laughing then because guess what? I knew that's that's the deal. And every now and again, we get lucky. We get such a visit uh, 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 visitation. These mushroom things. I don't see them as mind-altering. I see them as just something that opens the real door for who we are. And after a while, I would argue that I don't even need them now. I can be way off somewhere on my own in a garden on a day like this without taking a single mushroom. I can allow myself to just click in. And I'm fine. But back to my story. We, I asked the guy about, uh, and this is, just, uh, this is just really too beautiful, I think. I asked him about soulmates. And he said, well, what you need to understand, Bob, is we don't have, none of us have the soulmate. He says, maybe I could be wrong about that. Maybe one or two would argue that they have. But across the board, on the whole, in general, we don't. We rather, we come down as packs of soulmates. There are many of us. We come down as, as in soul groups. He says, for example, you'll have soul groups. You'll meet in the streets sometimes. You'll look at your smile, the smell back. You have no idea why you're almost in love with them. This is one of your soul groups you've known for thousands of years. He says, for example, it happened yesterday. And Kelly, this is where it got weird. For example, it came. It happened yesterday. After you paid for the couple's coffees, not, which is very nice, by the way, and you came outside, one of your soul groups who decided not to come down this time, not to come down this time, thought they'd just nip down for a quick hello. Do you remember? Oh, Kelly, I tell you, I swear to you, I'm getting emotional now, Tell you now. He steps aside. There's a woman from the bus stop yesterday in my room. But guess what? She brings with her all the memories of how we spent hundreds upon hundreds of years together. I just 
I just go. I go completely. I've got tears. I've got snot coming out my nose. I've got hiccups. I can't get enough tissues. My cat, Cassie, is going mental looking at the corner. It was just absolutely beautiful. And this is where I'm going to annoy some people. And I'm sorry. I really am sorry. But I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know that happened that day. And it was just remarkable. The whole trip, by the way, was, was six hours. It's a long haul. And I'm, you're knackered afterwards. But I, so here we go. I've got the magic mushroom. But competing with something that happened yesterday when I'm on coffee, yeah, I'm on a cup of tea, the identical thing, but I see it, I remember it, but now I get everything. So all of this stuff, this spiritual world that I live in, that we live in, all of us live in, whether we like it or not, whether we think it's a good idea or not, is completely linked to the hypnotic world that I walk in. <laughs> Absolutely. The magic world that I'm, I'm linked to and my mentalism all of it is completely impacted together. I've just been lucky to find these four things together this time right. around, along with the lucid dreaming. And, yeah. and you know, I, I get to go from there. It's really right. quite fantastic. Well, and, of course, the healing. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic story. And, of course, many of us have, have witnessed such things in our hypnosis sessions. I, I certainly have. I remember I had a, a gentleman in his 60s contact me for, for a session. He wanted a past life regression. And the reason he wanted it was he wanted to know why he was born a twin in this life. And then he asked, could his sister come and just observe? And I said, certainly. Some, some hypnotists don't like to have other people in the in this present when you're during the session, but I don't mind at all. And yeah, so, um, they arrived in my office and he was a pleasant gentleman. She, on the other hand, was not very pleasant. I could tell she was skeptical and, <laughs> and really doubting why he was there wasting his money and she'd been dragged along she brought some magazines to to read and 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 as we proceeded she was rattling the papers and i think being a little intentionally distracting which didn't bother me at all and at some point in the in the session i um, this man went somewhere and tears of joy started coming down his face and for the next 20 minutes, he just murmured, it's all joy. It's all love. That's all it was. He was it. just floating in the sea of love. Beautiful. And, yeah. and she glanced at him every now and then and scowled. And that was it. He was so happy with the <laughs> session. He just happily paid me and they went on their way. And um, about six months <laughs> later, I got a, an email from him just again, thanking and said that was life changing for him. And why? What I didn't tell you is that his sister weighed probably 350 pounds. She was quite obese. And, and in his email, he said, oh, by the way, my sister's lost 100 pounds since then. Which, you know, we can't explain these things. Something mm -hmm. happened to him. Maybe something happened to his twin at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, those are the kinds of things that stick in our mind, those kinds of experiences. And, I, and I've had I've had some dreams. You know, I lost my grandson a couple of years ago to suicide yeah. during the pandemic. And he was 16 years old. It was a very difficult experience for our family. And about a year ago, he came to me in a dream. And he said, don't worry. I know everything. It's exactly what you said. And that was so such a consolation to me. That, again, was life changing. It, 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 uh, it affirmed to me what I'd already known, which is good. It's good. You can know on some levels, but when you really know, no. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Your your perception of this reality shifts and your priorities in life shift, too, don't they? So that's, Completely, yeah. Absolutely. You know, whether whether we're witnessing that with a client or or you know a loved one who's passed, it it has such profound power. But being open to it, and I and I like how you you don't have to say that anything is is real or not real. That you allow yourself again that kind of flexibility. So Tamalinda had asked. Um, earlier do, do you do past life regression sessions with with people i've just got a whole history of past life regressions i'm barking i've not moved to southampton after many years and many years ago i was robert h burns ve honors across town 
with my pinstripe suit and my polka dot tie doing clinical uh, hypnosis. But on Saturday mornings, Kelly, I became uh, uh, Bob, the past life aggressor. When I got to wear my jeans, I was covered in beads. I had lots of beads. And all I did, all I did was past life regression. Uh, and I did it initially because I thought it was nonsense. And we don't have time to go into them. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful stories I could I could tell you. I mean, great ones, crackers. But it came to this this state where I had to I had to acknowledge the fact that, and this is what I believe now, that sure, lots of people are right that that wasn't a past life regression. That was someone's ridiculous imagination being absolutely daft. And this one, yeah, they were really actually acting, uh, and so on and so forth. But every now and again, we get some we get some crackers. I mean, we get some absolute beauties. Uh, they just we sit there and it just blows us away, completely blows us away. Um, so the answer is yes. I still do them to this day. Uh, uh, so if anyone wants to make contact on that, I'll, I'll happily help out. Maybe at this point I should say a couple of things on that, Kelly, of yeah. who I am and what I do. Please because do. Uh, I, uh, if anybody looks up my website, it's bobbonsafetytherapy.com. It's easy to get a hold of me. And you'll see that I've got things to sell in there books and stuff like that but my sessions my sessions are 120 pounds but kelly you'll know this through in the middle of covid i came across lots lots and lots of therapists who were broke as i as i was for a while it was i mean i had no business for three months when this stuff happened and i thought jesus i've got all these people in there so what i did was i put a th i went public didn't i and i offered sessions for therapists working therapists for 40 pounds so any therapist could come to me, pay me forty pounds, and it would be free. Here we go, Kelly. I'm back to a question you asked about forty five minutes ago. I says, by the way, if anyone is so broke you can't afford forty pounds, you tell me privately. Don't write it in here. You PM me. You write me privately. You you've no money, and the session or sessions, as many as you want, will be free. Now, a lot of people thought I was crazy when I wrote that, and I wasn't crazy when I wrote that. And a few people did come to me, and I worked with them for free. But they, and and you know what? I enjoyed it so much. I've can, I've kept that stuff on. In fact, I mean, I made that statement about six months ago. If there's any working, th listen, I'm 72 now. I'm getting on. I've paid my mortgage. I'm doing fine, and I still work well. I get good income with other people. If there's any working therapist anywhere in the world. What's a session with Bob Burns? You'll see my fees are 120 pounds, but not for you. You tell me you're a working therapist, it's automatically 40 pounds. Is that okay? And by the way, if you can't afford it, you tell me and it's free and it'll be good. Just because I'm doing it for free, don't you think it won't be good? I'm pretty good at this stuff. You'll be fine. I'll take care of you. And if it wants if they want it to be whoever was asking, a past life regression, I'll happily do that with you as well. Is that okay? That's more than okay. That's that's a fantastic good. offer, <laughs> and good, good, good. You, you know, of course, that this the replay of this will be there in perpetuity. So you're going to have to stick around. This will be the worst thing. For, this will be the worst. Oh no, half I've ever spent in my life. It's been a bad idea, Kelly. Don't blame bad me. Idea, lady. <laughs> what happened? What, what was her name? Kelly T. Woods. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know that Bob Burns, that that hundred and two year old fellow. Yes, he promised back in <laughs> yeah. 2023. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Kelly, you'll know this. But listen, people say to me, is that not a challenge? Is that, is that not a challenge? What, do I, what did I just say to you at the start of this? I did 30 years of healing for free. Do you think I've got a problem doing free stuff? It's mm -hmm. a pleasure to be sitting with somebody and doing either a session or or, or, or or healing. Why the hell would I want to take money from somebody who I've given? Could you imagine Jesus turning around and saying, that'll be $18, please, because, you know, it's just not going to happen, is it? And I did say I thought it was the second coming, so you know. Yeah, I love the I love these comparisons. They're they're marvelous. Anybody um, have any questions? Tamalinda asks um, about you. Do you have a Facebook page? Yeah, it's BobBurnsHypnotherapy.com. You can find me, and if you look up Bob Burns and the Swan, you'll find out all about me. No, that's your that's way, your website. Uh, do you have a Facebook page? Uh, yes, how can, but I don't understand. How can nobody find me on Facebook? Is it not easy? Oh, yeah. I, I don't there's know. Bob I was just asking. Uh, I'll look. I'm good. I'll look. Yeah. Yeah. I've got Bob on Sydney Therapy. I stepped back from it a little bit because it was just too much. It was, it was becoming too much. I've got two and a half thousand members and I'm spending all my time answering just small things. You better contact me through my website or contact me privately 
on Facebook, or contact me privately through my own uh, email, which is Bob Burns, the number seven, at AOL.com. That's the best way to contact me. Bob Burns seven at AOL.com. Sage. But that's um, lots of different. Go on, Kelly. Okay, Sage has a question. You'll have to unmute yourself. That's the one. Write the email well down first, or I would have forgotten. Um, well done, Tom Ruska. Okay, I have a question for you, Bob. Uh, sure. A year ago, I was on a webinar such as this, and I was introduced to the Swan, and I was like, it is amazing. And I wrote you, and I was like, this is an incredible tool. Thank you so much. And you said, you're welcome. It's too bad you won't use it or something along those lines. <laughs> you were nicer about it. But I was like, he's crazy. This is awesome. Why would anybody learn it and then not use it? And then I didn't use it. What happened? What's going on with that? I'm very good. I'm just highly skilled. This is what I do. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. You will now be happy for the rest of your life. And you won't even understand why. It's going to be great. Yeah. Bitty, bitty, bitty. Outstanding. <laughs> you say it, it's true. Thank you. I no, I wouldn't I wouldn't have said it like that. I know the words I use. Kelly will understand right. what I'm saying here. Kind of right. script with the stuff that I use. But I wouldn't have it would have been something. We would have gone into humor and I would have said, Yeah, but you'll probably never use it. It would have been something like that. Right. But if there's anything I can ever do to help you with that, and by the way, if anyone else is listening, it doesn't have to be a session if you want to contact me. If you want some mentoring, the price doesn't go up. Okay. So that's either the session or mentoring. That's what I that's the that's who I am and what I do. That's the same place. Is that okay? Yes, thank you so much. I, I just find it fascinating that I mean you're right, obviously, but uh why do we do such things? I don't know. Well, we're just but, but guess what? I'm ex I'm exactly the same. I, I in lots of things I'm gonna be doing and I never get around to doing it, you know. Uh it's uh there's like there's a, I'm I'm reminded of that, that lovely saying that you know I think it's David Thoreau, is that the name of the guy that most men live lives uh, sorry for the, the gender, but he wrote, most men live uh, lives of quiet desperation and go to their graves with their songs still in them. Henry David Thoreau, yeah? And that's just true. I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, that's just that's just the way it is. It's funny how for years our lives can seem like they're, and like my life, it seemed like my life was all chaotic and pretty aimless and carrying all the problems of the world. But if I look back now, I can clearly see that it's an, it's an exquisitely crafted novel and of such a fascinating life. But guess what? It's the same with everybody, I swear. If you just keep writing stuff down, I write stuff down. And I go back and I look at it and I go, oh my God, Jesus, I was, I was right enough there. And it looks hard and based on that as well, so on and so forth. There's two major mistakes that we make in my back again to you, you use it, you won't use it. In my, my understanding, we make two major mistakes in life. The first thing is we worry about what other people think about us. And I can tell that by looking at Facebook and what people write. So we worry about what other people think about us. And the other one is we worry about people think about us in the first place. Why, why would you do that? Why would you worry about people think about you in the first place? I swear to you, if you can get rid of these two things, just these two things, your life will become astronomical. Astronomical. Because the only thing that's left is just life. And apart from that, if there's any challenges that any of us have got in any way, shape, or form, guess what? Compared to infinity, we're only going to have to suffer it for that much longer. You'll be out of here. You're walking your way back home as we speak. That's how great it is, yeah? We're all winning as we speak. We just don't know it. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, even though it's not a race. Hey, Bob, Catherine, okay. Catherine has a question for you. Come on, Catherine. Hi, Bob. Um, I'll get to my question in a moment. When my mother died, I wrote an article about my experience with her, and the title of it was We're All Walking Each Other Home. Oh, I had just yeah. heard that phrase. I yeah, think back it's Das. I think it's a guy called Das that maybe wrote it. Ra Das? Yeah, it like is that? Ram Das. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my question to you is you said that you can click in. And so are you able to click in without the mushrooms or the, or the drugs? You can just, with intention, click in? That was a well, phrase that you used. It's, this isn't going. This is going. To, it's not, it doesn't happen. It's, let me give you an idea of what I mean. And and it's it's much easier if I'm talking to people who do it. If I, for example, if I'm talking to somebody that does DMT, they know exactly what I mean within five seconds. Somebody with mushrooms, they know exactly what I mean with five. I what and so on and so forth. So 
a lot of them, after a while, they've got the ability to do it. So right now, I'm at an airport. I'm fed up, right? So I will just click in. Hi, guys. That's my opening. Dear God. It's not dear God for me. It's hi, guys. So I'm here. And the plane is now delayed for another 90 minutes. What should we be talking about? What should we be thinking about? Maybe it would be a good idea to now sit back, now pause, and suddenly, whoa, stuff will come in. Now, don't get me wrong. I realize I could be off my head. I realize this could be totally my imagination. But leave me alone. It's my world. And I've got the evidence to suggest to me that it's not. That it's something else. By the way, I also realize I'm surrounded with people who are indeed fooling themselves, as I have done many times. So it's, a, it's not dangerous, but you know, you've got to be, you've got to think what you're doing. But come back to the same thing. How do I feel about it? How do I feel about how I'm how I'm handling stuff? And how can I? I mean, my my best friend in the world right now. I'm a dog man. I'm not a cat man. Guess what I've got? Bloody cat. Because my wife likes cats, so I'm left now looking at my cat. Guess what? Discovered it's great. My cat is fantastic. My cat looks at me like that. And if I don't stop her, she'll look at me like that for six hours, in between pours. It's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. So I become like my cat, and I, and I sit and I look at it and I go, yeah, yeah, I've got it. And I've got it from Buddha. Buddha and my cat, they're like that. We sit under the tree and we just, yeah, it's fine. We're here for, like I said, compared to infinity, no time whatsoever. What if you planned this? What if you said, I think I'll be down again. I think I'll live till I'm 82. I'll have lots of aches and pains from 40 onwards. I'll have this challenge here. I'll get divorced at 36, and I'll be bloody bitter about that. But I'll find out some things about it that will be quite cool. I'll come back here and write out my report when I get there. Now, what if you did this as well, and you and we are friends, and you left me on the other side, and you're down there asking for help because of your hip, and I fix your hip for you because we're friends. You pop your clogs at 82, you come back, and you kick the shit out of me because you told me, don't help me. I'm going down there to live with this problem, and we'll see what happens. And I say, but I love you. And you're saying, if you love me, you're going to give me a little bit of help, but no more. And I often talk about this with my guys in the big room. I say, I know you can't fix this. I mean, I've got heart disease, and I've got arrhythmia. I'm 72, for Christ's sake. Why should I be complaining? It's a walk in the park. Yeah, so I so I've got I've got arthritis in, in, in both hips. I've got I've got heart disease. I've got arrhythmia, and and but it's okay. Something could you give me a good day today? I really like that, and I get a good day, and it's just fantastic news. That's the bit of it all. If we can just roll with it, it's just fine. It's just fine. So I don't need to know about life, you know, about regression, so on and so forth. And I don't need to have an absolute contact now. I'm kind of there. But other people do, and I'm there for them to pull them into that area, but I need to mm, give them a little push so they can handle it themselves. One of the best things I've ever done, of course, was the swan. If you're not swanning, you should be swanning, because the swan is a wonderful opportunity to everything, absolutely everything. But again, that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, your opinion is very valid in that regard, and I will vouch for the swan. I love it since I was very had this very first introduction to it. And one area that it's great with is working with kids. Kids are natural swanners and they're fascinated yeah. with it. There is a very serious question here from Fiona Carroll for you. She says, hi, Bob, I'm a Yorkshire woman. I've never met a Scots man who drinks 0% alcohol beer. What is that all about? That's a great question. Uh, so I've got arrhythmia, yeah. And um uh... So and, and I used to get it for a, for a couple of days, then it would go off, then a week and it would go off. And then I had a really not a good session at all. I went back to do regular sessions and I went to do a live one at Birmingham after three years through COVID, just doing things online. And so I'm standing on my feet for two, two, eight or days. I'm feeling okay, but I don't go out at night. I go back to my room for the first time ever. And by the way, if you want to, you better believe it. I can drink alcohol, not as much as Kelly T. Woods, but I can handle my own with the best of them. Anyway, I've got cold sweats all the way through the night, yeah? Cold sweats. I get up the next day. I drive 400 miles back home. I go to the doctors. And they're pretty convinced I've had a couple of heart attacks while I was teaching the swan. How about that? Wow. Um, and as soon as they told me, I thought, yeah, that feels about right. You know, I wasn't even there in the room. So I, I didn't know how to handle this. And my English wife, who 
I kind of love that what I'm, what, Kelly will tell you what a morning woman she is, really. So bad. Anyway, she says to me, would you ever consider not drinking? Because she, my wife thought I was an alcoholic. I always knew I wasn't an alcoholic. I was somebody who really loved booze. And I come from a family where a bottle of whiskey for me is watching a movie. Yeah. So that's how dangerous it was. So I thought, I wonder what would happen if I stopped. It was a Tuesday night and I stopped drinking alcohol. By the way, the, the rhythmia had come back on and it had been with me now for nearly a year. Non-stop. Not fun. Mm. Just not fun at all. I stopped drinking on the Tuesday. My rhythmia went away on the Thursday. Stayed away for three months and I went out and I got myself a large glass of red wine. And one whiskey before I went to bed at night. My arrhythmia came racing back within hours. So there's a part within me saying, ah, 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 silly boy. You've asked for help. We've given you help. We've shown you the way. For you now, Bob, 72 years, no more alcohol for you. I think so. So hence the zero beer, which is great. I'm fine with it. I don't need alcohol. Every now and again, I'll, if I'll go into a pub and I'll have a pint of a fine ale with a dash of lemonade, I'm fine. That's most I'll ever have. So now I just, I'm just going with alcohol. I don't have alcohol. And I've stopped having sex with the neighbours because I, I just wasn't right. It, it never bothered me, but yeah. I never felt right about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll I hear from, you, Tom. Yeah. We will all send you best wishes for your health to continue to improve. And congratulations for making that maybe life-saving change. And, you know, that just shows the power that can come when our attention is really grasped, Right. When Absolutely. we are paying attention in the right way. And we're coming to a conclusion of this. And I want to thank you so much, Bob. It's been, as always, a delight to spend time with you. And Love I know you, that, that the attendees here really enjoyed it too. And they're all saying so in the in the chat box here. And they know how to get in touch with you if they want to continue um making a, an even stronger relationship with you. It's you're one of my favorite in this world and other worlds too. And if anybody sends me any of the details, I'll give them details for the next, probably a few months from now, but I'll be running an online workshop. If they're more interested in that, I'll love to give them the details of it. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I'm going to stop this recording now. <laughs>